According to the Quran, Muhammad was accused of stealing various stories. For example, in Quran 25.5 we read, And they say, Legends of the former peoples which he has written down, and they are dictated to him morning and afternoon. The fact of the matter is many stories of the Quran have been traced back to various uninspired texts. That much of the Quran was plagiarized from earlier uninspired Jewish, Christian, and Gnostic texts has been proven in W. St. Clair Tistall's book, The Original Sources of the Quran, and other works. Such uninspired original texts include apocryphal gospels, midrashim, targumim, and apocryphal Gnostic works. The Quran mentions various biblical figures, yet many of its stories about these figures are not found in the inspired Jewish and Christian scriptures. Well, where then do they come from? The story of Abraham being delivered from fire which Nimrod created to destroy him is found in numerous passages of the Quran. According to this story, Abraham's father used to make idols, and Abraham sold them. Abraham disliked this and mocked the purchase of such idols. Abraham then preached monotheism and tried to convert his father and the people. His father refused. Then news spread about Abraham's preaching and it reached Nimrod. Nimrod then put Abraham in a fire from which Abraham escaped. This Quranic story comes from Midrash Rabbah, which is an uninspired Jewish homiletical interpretation of the Bible from around the 5th century, it states. Terah was a maker of idols. Once he went out somewhere and seated Abraham as salesman in place of himself, a person would come wishing to purchase, and Abraham would say to him, How old art thou? And he, the other, would say to him, Fifty or sixty years. And he, Abraham, would say unto him, Woe to that man who is sixty years of age, and wisheth to worship a thing a few days old. He, Terah, delivered him over to Nimrod. He, Nimrod, said to him, let us worship the fire, if thou bandiest words with me, lo, I worship not but the fire. Lo, I cast thee into the midst of it, and let the God whom thou worshipest come and deliver thee from it. Abraham went down into the furnace of fire and was delivered." Unquote. Now the interesting thing which proves this story is false, and how it reached Muhammad, is that when translating Genesis 15.7 from Hebrew to Aramaic, which says Abraham was brought from Ur of the Chaldeans, Jonathan ben Uzael wrongly rendered the Babylonian word Ur into the Aramaic word light or fire. The pattern is Muhammad tells a story and we can trace the story back to some kind of forgery or some other historically inaccurate account. And a, a funny example is uh, it, it has to do with um, something Muhammad said about Abraham. Um, basically in the Bible, Genesis 15, we're told that God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldeans. The Babylonian language Ur means city, so it's the city of the Chaldeans. Uh, but in the first century, a Jewish rabbi named Jonathan ben Uziel was translating Genesis 15 into Aramaic, and he came across the word Ur. He didn't know how to speak Babylonian, so he confused the Babylonian word Ur, which means city, with the Hebrew word Ur, which means fire. And this mistake caused him to mistranslate the passage. Instead of saying that God delivered Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldeans, uh, Jonathan's mistranslation said that God delivered Abraham out of the fire of the Chaldeans. Now, why is this important? Well, Jewish writers ran with this idea of Abraham escaping the fire. And so the Talmud eventually contains stories in which Abraham was thrown into a fire by the Chaldeans and was miraculously rescued by God. These stories were uh, popular in Arabia during the time of Muhammad, which is crucial because in the Quran, Surah 21, we read about Abraham being delivered from the fire. Now, Muhammad claimed that he got this story from God, but we know that the story of Abraham being delivered from the fire was based on a mistranslation of the word Ur. So what makes more sense here, that God also mistranslated the word Ur, or that Muhammad was getting some of his stories from the people around him? Uh, this is why it's not surprising to read in uh, chapter 25, verse 5 of the Quran that Muhammad's contemporaries were accusing him of copying various tales in the Quran from earlier writers. Now, in Quran 27, 17 to 44, there is a story of Solomon and Bathsheba. Here the Quran says Solomon trained birds in battle to drop stones on enemies. Then Solomon could not find his hoopy bird and he got upset. 
But the Hoopy Bird then came to Solomon talking to him, and told him about this woman named Queen Bathsheba. Then Solomon sent the Hoopy Bird with a letter to give Bathsheba. After a quarrel, Bathsheba ended up at Solomon's palace, and when entering Solomon's court, she lifted up her dress uncovering her legs, because she thought the floor was made of water, when really it was made of glass. Now, this exact tale comes from the earlier uninspired Jewish second Targum of Esther, aka Targum Sheni, which says, quote, One day the king Solomon, observing that the mountain cock or hoopy was absent, ordered that the bird be summoned forthwith. When it arrived, it declared that it had, for three months, been flying higher and thither seeking to discover some country not yet subjected to Solomon, and had at length found a land in the east exceedingly rich in gold, silver, and plants, whose capital was called Kitor, and whose ruler was a woman known as the Queen of Saba, Sheba. The bird suggested that it should fly to the queen and bring her to Solomon. The king approved this proposal, and Solomon accordingly caused a letter to be tied to the hoopy's wing. On being informed of her arrival, Solomon sent his chief minister, Benaiah, to meet her, and then seated himself in a glass pavilion. The queen, thinking that the king was sitting in water, lifted her dress, which caused Solomon to smile." Unquote. So clearly, this is the exact story found in the Quran. Because of this Targum's reflection of persecution from Byzantine Catholics and due to linguistic reasons, the Targum expert Bernard Grossfield dates it to the early 7th century, at the end of the Byzantine period, before the rise of Islam. This dating is confirmed by the German scholar Beit Ego. In fact, the Encyclopedia of Religious and Philosophical Writings in Late Antiquity, edited by Jacob Neusner and Alan Jeffrey Avery Peck, Notes most scholars today agree with this dating. Since this Targum was composed prior to the rise of Islam and later spreading of the Quran, it could not have borrowed the story from the Quran. The Quran borrowed the silly tale from the Targum orally. Now in Quran 1922 26, a story is told of Mary being pregnant with Jesus and then traveling to a far place to give birth, where she then rests under a palm tree. God tells her to shake the trunk of the tree so dates would drop from it. Then she ate and drank and became refreshed. This tale is found in the uninspired apocryphal book, The Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew, aka History of the Nativity of Mary and the Infancy of the Savior. It says, quote, Mary was fatigued by the excessive heat of the sun in the desert, and seeing a palm tree, she said to Joseph, Let me rest a little under the shade of this tree. She looked up to the foliage of the palm, and saw it full of fruit, and said to Joseph, I wish it were possible to get some of the fruit of this palm. And Joseph said to her, I am thinking more of the want of water, because the skins are now empty, and we have none wherewith to refresh ourselves and our cattle. Then the child Jesus said to the palm, O tree, bend thy branches, and refresh my mother with thy fruit. And immediately at these words the palm tree bent its top down to the very feet of the blessed Mary, and they gathered from its fruit, with which they were all refreshed." Unquote. Again, this is the same story. As to the dating of this apocryphal book, Bart Ehrman argues for a date of composition in the first quarter of the 7th century, which is prior to the rise of Islam and the spread of the Quran. He notes, quote, M. Berthold has argued that Pseudo-Matthew shows evidence of literary dependence on the Vita Agnitas of Pseudo-Ambrose, which itself was used in the De Virginate of Aldhelm of Malmesbury in 690. On these grounds, Pseudo-Matthew must obviously date to some time in the mid-7th century at the earliest. In the most thorough analysis to date, Gisjol has maintained that even though direct literary dependence on the rule of Benedict cannot be demonstrated, there are enough general similarities to suggest that the book was written when monastic orders were beginning to expand in the West by someone invested in them. Largely on these grounds, he makes a convincing argument that the text was produced in the first quarter of the 7th century by a monk in the Latin-speaking West." Unquote. Thus again, we have the Quran orally borrowing fables from uninspired earlier books. Next, in various Quranic verses, we see Jesus speaking in his cradle. For example, Quran 19, 29-30 says, quote, But she pointed to him. They said, How should we speak to one who is a child in the cradle? He said, I am indeed a servant of Allah. He has given me the book and made me a prophet, and he has made me blessed wherever I may be, and he has enjoined on me prayer and poor rate as long as I live. The idea of Jesus speaking to his mother from his cradle comes from the Arabic gospel of infancy of the Savior. In that document we read, quote, Jesus spoke and indeed, when he was lying in his cradle, said to Mary his mother, 
I am Jesus, son of God, the Logos, whom thou hast brought forth, as the angel Gabriel announced to thee, and my Father has sent me for the salvation of the world." Unquote. Muhammad simply altered the wording to fit his theology. This document is dated from the 5th to 6th century. The same idea of Jesus speaking from the cradle can also be found in the earlier infancy gospel of Thomas, which the aforementioned Arabic gospel of infancy utilized. The infancy gospel of Thomas says, being an infant, he, Jesus, uttered such things. This document is dated to the end of the second century. It is a Gnostic text, and its story of Jesus speaking as an infant with wisdom was made up or invented to promote the Gnostic idea of Jesus' extraordinary gnosis or wisdom. Thus, Muhammad incorrectly assumed these uninspired apocryphal invented Gnostic tales he heard orally were reliable and included them into the Quran. What a disaster! Again, Muhammad did not have the Bible translated into Arabic, so he could not check if such stories were reliable and biblical. Now, in Quran 349 and 5, 109 to 110, we are told about Jesus creating birds out of dust and then breathing life into them. This idea comes from the same sources just mentioned. The accounts state, quote, He, Jesus, had made figures of birds and sparrows, which flew when he told them to fly, and then he took from the bank of the stream some soft clay and formed out of it twelve sparrows, and there were other boys playing with him. Then Jesus clapped together the palms of his hands, called to the sparrows, and said to them, Go, fly away, and while you live, remember me. Now in Quran 18, 8-25, we are told about the legend of the companions of a cave. In this story, a group of seven youths and their dog take refuge in a cave from danger, and miraculously they are able to sleep in it for about three hundred years, after which they wake up and leave. This legend of seven sleepers or companions in a cave actually comes from two uninspired Syriac homilies of Jacob of Sarag in the late 6th century, as well as Gregory of Tours' Latin version from the late 6th century. The story spread rapidly into other languages after its composition, showing how attractive the silly legend was. Lastly, the story of Iblis, i.e. Satan and Adam, is found in various texts of the Quran. In this tale, God commands the angels to prostrate before Adam, but Satan refuses because he said he is better than Adam since Adam was only created from clay. Then Satan is expelled from heaven. Now the expert on Quranic origins and oral composition, Andrew Bannister, tells us which uninspired pre-Islamic texts this story comes from, quote, The oldest extant version of this story is found in the Vitae Adei et Evei, 13.1-16.3 which some scholars argue could originally be as old as 100 BC, although the current Latin text dates to circa AD 400. In this version, the story is told in the first person, with Satan explaining to Adam why he was cast out of heaven. Satan reports that it was Michael who had brought Adam before the angels and commanded them to worship him. Satan refused, protesting that Adam was younger and inferior, so Adam should be worshipped by him. Michael continued to insist upon obedience, but Satan and many angels refused, following which God cast them out of heaven. There are many Jewish versions of Iblis and Adam, including allusions to the tale in both Second Enoch and a myriad rabbinic uses of the story. Ginsberg discusses these, several of which combine it, and the account of Adam naming the animals, as does Surah 2. Satan protests to God that he and the angels had been created from Shekinah glory itself and were now being asked to prostrate to a thing made from dust. It is at this point that God asks Satan to demonstrate his superiority by naming the animals. He fails, Adam succeeds, and Satan is cast out of heaven. Bannister also notes the story is found in some uninspired Christian documents like the 3rd century The Gospel of Bartholomew, 4, 51-55, and the 6th century The Book of the Cave of Treasure. Bannister concludes, quote, Thus it is clear that various forms of the Iblis and Adam story enjoyed a wide provenance in the centuries preceding Islam and were well known within both Jewish and Christian communities. When the Quran emerged in the 7th century, it did so in an oral culture in which Biblicist traditions were freely circulating, and thus there existed a large pool of commonly known stories and traditions to fish from, unquote. In fact, to seal the deal, Bannister has shown the three common elements that appear in all seven Quranic versions of the story are the same three common elements present in the pre-Islamic sources which tell the story. This proves the Quran lifted this fable from these earlier sources. Now, the only difficulty is that although all these various stories we mentioned are the same, 
There is no textual overlap when you examine the Quran and the stories in these pre-Islamic documents side by side. In other words, Muhammad or someone he knew did not copy from the original documents word for word. This is where Andrew Bannister's new research comes into play. In his groundbreaking book, An Oral Formulaic Study of the Quran, which is based on his PhD work, he proves not only that the Quran was recited and transmitted orally, but that it was actually composed orally in live performance with formulaic diction, i.e. short repeated phrases or groups of words that can be reused to express a key idea. This shows Muhammad was an oral performer or preacher, fishing from a pool of oral material in his culture, which can be traced back to these uninspired Jewish, Christian, and Gnostic texts. With the help of computerized linguistic analysis, Bannister has proven this. He notes, quote, Oral formulaic analysis proceeds by analyzing a text looking for the presence of repeated formulaic phrases in a text. Formulaic diction is a tool frequently used by oral performers to facilitate composition at speed, live in performance. To further establish this, Bannister also established the oral culture surrounding the Quran and the existence of folk memory in Islamic sources, i.e. Muhammad's ability to produce Quranic sayings as necessity demanded it, often in response to a question or challenge from an audience. His conclusion based on his study is that large portions of the Quran were constructed live in oral performance based on earlier oral legends. Some features in the Quranic stories he brought out proving this are performance features, multiple versions of the same story exhibiting flexibility and fluidity in their telling, frequent audience asides scattered throughout the Quran, and also highly elusive referencing. He found the Quran's overall formulaic density ranges from 52.18% to 23.55%. A density comfortably beyond 20% is often considered to indicate formulaic borrowing or that a text was composed orally from stock phrases or elements. Formulaic density refers to the percentage of a given text that consists of short repeated phrases indicating oral composition. He found there are 99 surahs of the Quran with a formulaic density of 20% or higher. 69 of these have a formulaic density of 40% or higher. 45 of these have a formulaic density of 50% or higher. 14 of these have a formulaic density of 16% or higher. And one surah, surah 61, has a formulaic density of 77% or higher. This is groundbreaking and shows the Quran is not from God. Instead, Muhammad composed its surahs in performance fashion using common oral formulas borrowed from fables or stories traced back to uninspired apocryphal Jewish, Christian, and Gnostic texts. This destroys the Quran and Islam.